for this week, uh, I am going to turn things over to Dr. Patrick Henson, um, who does uh, a ton of different things at Vanderbilt, uh, is the director of our uh, holding and pre-op areas, and PACU um, is one of our intensivists, is uh, on the perioperative consult service as of um, this year, which I'm super excited about. Um, and has spent a tremendous amount of time uh, working with both his own knowledge as an anesthesiologist and intensivist, perioperative physician, but also with our endocrinologist to put together a whole new set of guidelines that has been presented, but I don't think we can yet present enough um, about perioperative glycemic control. And so he's going to be uh, talking to us about that today. So um, without any, also is just the best looking guy that I know and has a witty sense of humor. So I, I thought that I would, uh, um, I'll, I'll end with that. Uh, He's someone yeah. who persistently, I learn from all the time and he makes me chuckle, particularly at myself when he makes fun of me. Um, but, but with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Henson. Such a, uh, man, boy, how do I, uh, how do I get over that? Um, can you all see my screen? We can. Great. Yeah. So, uh, I know I put patient in here twice. It's driving me crazy. Um, and I'll have to change it for the next one. But my name is Patrick Henson, associate professor here at Vanderbilt. Um, thanks, Dr. McAvoy, for that wonderful introduction. I have a lot of slides. I have a lot of words. Just sit back and uh, listen and might get more than, uh, than you know, trying to take notes, certainly. I'd like to talk to you about glucose management of the perioperative and critically ill. Um, so first, a little bit about me. Uh, not much to say that doesn't start or stop with these four as we're on our way to family pictures, an endless source of support for me, but not to be outdone. We all have to have a best friend, and this is mine. I'm a fan of Dallas sports in general, Cowboys, Mavericks, Rangers, uh, all the teams I root for. To augment my clinical time, I like to teach simulation courses for the National ECMO Organization, ELSO. Here I am uh, demonstrating how a patient can sit up with an ECMO cannula. In my free time, I enjoy music. Occasionally, you could see me playing with my 16-year-old daughter on Twitter. And if you come over to the house, we can listen to records together. A little bit of backstory. This is Chelsea. Right around the time she was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, she passed within a year, victim of a difficult-to-manage case of DKA. Chelsea was my sister, and before I even knew I wanted to be a physician, I thought I wanted to cure diabetes. Fast forward around 20 years or so, and I'm working late in the OR. Obviously, my career has taken a little bit of a different path. An add-on case is placed in my room for a kidney transplant. I go to see the patient, evaluate him, and prepare for the OR. Along the way, this patient, a type 1 diabetic, relays to me that he has stopped his insulin pump at his doctor's request because he'd been having difficult to manage uh, issues with hypoglycemia. The case proceeds relatively uneventfully. We used a basal IV insulin infusion with boluses to maintain his blood glucose in the prescribed range. He finishes and recovers in PACU. The insulin drip is stopped, and he's transferred to the floor. Overnight, the patient develops extreme hyperglycemia in the 400s and signs of DK and hyperkalemia. Luckily, he was treated appropriately and recovered, but a gap in care was identified. This was a type 1 diabetic without a standard insulin regimen prescribed, and those patients are at extremely high risk of complication, including DK and possibly even death. While this oversight cannot be directly attributed to the care of an anesthesiologist, the perioperative physician should be aware that patients such as this need both blood glucose monitoring and insulin regimens at all times. It was while identifying these problems and holes, working on solutions to standardize care for these patients, that I reinvigorated my interest in helping patients with diabetes and hyperglycemia. In the seven years since, I've uh, worked quite a bit on this, developed quite an interest in the underlying thoughts. So what is glucose? Fuel for all cells, building block for life, six carbon sugar comprised of the most basic elements, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Has some variety. There's dietary versions. We have concentrated forms created to sweeten our foods, but all feed into the same pathway. We also have intravenous forms available for patients who cannot take an oral glucose. It's an extremely easy substance to take in and tolerate for all living organisms. As the chief source of fuel for most, if not all cells, glucose is the main component of cellular respiration, generating ATP, the actual energy for cellular work. Humans only have about four grams of glucose circulating at any time. That's roughly the amount in a Jolly Rancher. Patients with moderate to severe diabetes, however, have approximately the amount of two Jolly Rancher candies circulating. So the single glucose molecules are very inefficiently stored. Living organisms have a way to maintain glucose in bundles, allowing it to be mobilized for immediate use. Glycogen, the main storage vehicle for humans, is stored primarily in the liver and muscle tissue. And the total amount of glycogen is about 600 grams. It's important to remember that some organ systems, such as brain, red blood cell, and renal medulla, are obligate users of glucose, for some reserves have to be maintained. 
For context, we take sugars in as starches, which are broken down in our diet and absorb this glucose. They're stored in a more condensed form, which we can then break down at a later time. In contrast with the most abundant sugar in the world, plant cellulose, you see the structural differences. And remember the linkages in plant cellulose cannot be broken down by the human gut, rendering them ineffective at supplementing blood glucose. So the condition known as diabetes is one that's been around the world for a while. You may recognize the gentleman on the left is Wilford Brimley, uh, an actor recently passed who was a spokesman person for diabetes education and for corporations who develop diabetes tools. What we should know is that the epidemiology of diabetes is pretty significant. About 12% of the people in the United States have diabetes, and about a third of those are undiagnosed. A huge proportion of the population that has a potentially debilitating condition um, and uh, do not know. So as you get older, the prevalence increases. So around 30% of those patients aged 65 or older will have diabetes. And there's about 100 million people who have a diagnosis of pre-diabetes. The clusters aren't terribly important for this talk. There's some age-related and health-related characteristics of these diabetic clusters. But important things for our bedside management are they're insulin deficient and insulin resistant. Diabetes, historically type 1 and type 2. The majority of this discussion is going to center around the treatment of hyperglycemics in type 2 patients. It's strongly recommended that type 1 patients be treated with a structured plan in collaboration with their primary providers and endocrinology. And I would want to make sure that anyone creating a plan for a type 1 diabetic do so with that consultation. What are some of the complications of diabetes? I think we're all too familiar with things like, like poor wound healing, cardiovascular issues, coronary lesions, poor blood flow resulting in ulcerative lesions, nerve damage, and kidney disease. When we put the human body in stressful situations, it responds differently, but often by mobilizing blood glucose. So raising the blood glucose level to allow for brain and muscle tissue and red blood cells to perform more tasks and either escape the invader or fight the infection. The impact of this stress, especially if it's long standing, results in a hyperglycemic response. And from that, some problems with cellular and organ dysfunction. Hormonal switches activate and suppress areas in the brain, bloodstream, fat, and GI tract, causing patients to have difficult to control breakdown of tissue and a resistance to building, which alters body composition and energy expenditure, even in the acute phase. Over time, the signals become less effective at permitting true regulation and result in a dysregulated metabolic pathway. Importantly, the breakdown of building blocks of fat, such as fat and muscle result in the generation of reactive oxygen species and inflammatory compounds that can worsen underlying health problems or create new ones. Two hormones that it's imperative to appreciate if not understand are glucagon and insulin. Glucagon is the mobilization hormone attaching to cellular receptors acting through a cascade of intracellular processes. Glycogen is broken down into glucose, which is utilized in the cells or spilled into the circulation. The other polypeptide insulin promotes the uptake of glucose through cellular receptors and it allows that glucose to do work within the cell or be stored as glycogen. Very chaotic web of actions taking place here among some very important organ systems, the liver, brain, fat, muscle, and red blood cells, all of whom are linked in the building and breakdown of substrate. In peaceful times, after taking a meal, getting good sleep, exercising regularly, taking your vitamins, we're able to use glucose to generate building blocks, build muscle, maintain brain health, optimize fat, and store glycogen in the liver. In stressful situations, all of this is reversed. Adipose broken down to fatty acids and glycerol, muscles and liver segments broken down to generate amino acids. And all of this can be used to generate energy for the stress response, however, less efficiently, and with secondary byproducts, not to mention the impact on the organs. This is a process known as gluconeogenesis is a major part of why persistent hyperglycemia can occur in patients with insulin resistance. Certain genes exist that mitigate this process in response to insulin. However, in diabetic patients with chronic insulin resistance, gluconeogenesis is not effectively turned off. And even in the presence of high blood glucose and high insulin, gluconeogenesis will still be occurring. One of the important systems to focus on is the endothelium. As an intensivist, I'm exquisitely interested in this. The lining of the blood vessels in the entire body provide functions such as keeping fluid in the blood vessels and other fluids out, maintaining tone for blood pressure, promoting new blood vessel formation, and maintaining the clotting cascade. Also provides avenues for immune and other cells to get from point A to point B. In chronic diabetes, dysfunction of the endothelial barrier creates problems with nitric oxide and cellular signaling, activations and disruptions of various components of the endothelium. Presence of inflammation and other compounds can impair the ability of this structure to vasoconstrict or relax, resulting in diabetic endothelial dysfunction.
to some degree, we can measure this dysfunction. We'll look at a little bit at the endothelial glycocalyx, which is a reasonably hot topic in critical care medicine. We're not exactly sure what to do with it yet, however. I think some of the changes can give us some insight into what happens with the acute and chronic hyperglycemic patient. As we get acute hyperglycemia, such as with a dextrose infusion, the lining of the endothelium is shed. These protein and sugar mixes that are broken down, metabolized and excreted, you can see here within six hours of hyperglycemia, we've broken down a significant component of the volume of the glycocalyx, and this is in the absence of a true stress. And if we remember that this endothelial glycocalyx protects the lining of the endothelium, we should also remember the clotting system relies on foreign substances to activate it. Here we see some evidence that disrupting this lining causes activation of the native clotting system as manifested by increased prothrombin and D-dimers. So that brings me to the first question, is hyperglycemia an epidemiologic problem in hospitalized patients? We have some evidence to reference hospitalized patients in a large population. In a retrospective study, of around 26% of patients had a blood glucose of 180 or greater at some point. And the average point of care blood glucose in this large patient population, non-ICU hospitalized patients was 166. In a separate group, over half the patients without diabetes had post-operative hyperglycemia with a blood glucose greater than 140. So I think that answers the question of whether hyperglycemia is a problem in hospitalized patients. It definitely appears to exist, even in non-diabetic hospitalized patients. Does hyperglycemia worsen medical outcomes? Having diabetes as well as having poorly controlled diabetes appears to impact several post-operative outcomes, including length of stay, need for ICU admission, and major complication. In general, the complication rate is higher across the board in diabetic patients presenting for non-cardiac surgery, and it's a significant predictor of postoperative myocardial ischemia, placing patients in about a two times risk of negative outcome if they have diabetes. In neurosurgical patients, almost all complications are increased with increased blood glucose. And in cardiac surgical patients, intraoperative hyperglycemia is an independent risk factor for complications such as death, renal, and pulmonary events. In a large general surgery population, a blood glucose of 200 is associated with twice the risk of mortality than a normal blood glucose of 100. But a lot of these cases are perhaps niche cases that not everybody does. We don't all do cardiac or neurosurgery cases, and we expect an inherent increased risk in complication in some of those, as well as maybe a little bit harder to control blood glucose. What about some potentially lower acuity cases that you may do more frequently outside of a teaching hospital? Well, patients who have breast reconstruction, usually after mastectomy, have a significant in infection rate rise with a preoperative blood glucose rise. You can see with the red bars, <clears throat> the 90-day infection, that infection rate is never very low, but as the blood glucose increases, the number of patients with infection relative to all, without also rises. In fact, having a preoperative blood glucose over 200 increases your 90-day infection incidence by about 25%, relative to having a blood glucose of 140. In total joint arthroplasty, increased postoperative blood glucose is associated with periprosthetic joint infection risk, and to an even greater degree when you factor in non-diabetic patients who have postoperative hyperglycemia. I'd like to highlight one ICU complication that may result for hypoglycemia that we don't always think about, which is neuromyopathy. It's an underappreciated function of critical illness with short-term complications of increased mortality increased difficulty with nutrition, weaning of ventilation and long-term complications of delay of discharge home and poor physical function. Hyperglycemia has been identified as one of the earliest potential modifiable risk factors for these patients. So which group of hyperglycemic patients is at higher risk? So previously we looked at this non-cardiac surgery population separated by those with diabetes and without. And we see the complication rates higher overall in the diabetic population. And surprisingly, perhaps, we see the mortality rate increases at the extremes of hyperglycemia, or unsurprisingly, rather. But interestingly, non-diabetic patients have a significantly higher risk of death as the mean blood glucose increases relative to their baseline counterparts. So these graphs are telling us that relative to their own group of normal glycemic patients, diabetic patients' risk of mortality seems to be less related to acute blood glucose fluctuation and perhaps more related to underlying problems with diabetes, whereas non-diabetic patients may have a much greater impact of hyperglycemia in relation to mortality. 
focusing here on the picture on the right, the gray bar is meant to show us the risk of mortality in patients with diabetes versus without. You can see that in the normal range of blood glucose, the odds ratio of mortality is significantly higher in a diabetic population, which is the gray bar. As we get hyperglycemic, the odds of mortality actually improve for the diabetic population relative to the non-diabetic population. Still unclear what this means from a significant standpoint, but very interesting work. To complete this part of the discussion, we'll look at the paradoxical association of hyperglycemia and surgical complications actually reinforcing that as blood glucose rises, the separation between diabetic and non-diabetic patients and complications increases. The patients with hyperglycemia without a diagnosis of diabetes are significantly more likely to have complications and mortality. So knowing all of this and the supposed value of maintaining normal blood glucose, we should consider how patients are treated. Doctors Bunting and Best are responsible for the first human use of insulin to treat a young boy with DK in Toronto, 1922. A hundred year anniversary was just this last January and doctors Bunting and Best were awarded the Nobel prize in 1923 for their work. In 1978, the lab at Eli Lilly worked on the first drug made from recombinant DNA using E. coli to generate insulin. The product Humulin was released in 1982 and opened up the world to the benefits of a new technology. Most diabetic patients are managed with oral or injectable medication that they can administer themselves at home. Some medications impair the ability of the intestine to absorb glucose. Metformin is one of the world's most prescribed medications and actually a large part of the medication burden in lakes and rivers. It reduces the ability of the liver to synthesize and release glucose effectively blocking gluconeogenesis. The sulfonylurea is increased secretion of endogenous insulin. The thiazolidine dions help the body use its own insulin more effectively. The GLP-1 and incretin agonists mimic natural hormones that promote insulin release and may actually stimulate new pancreatic islet cell development. And the SGLT-2 inhibitors increase renal excretion of glucose and decrease reabsorption. So metformin is being assessed for having other benefits outside of a blood glucose manipulation, including possibly reducing the risk of dementia, whereas the SGLT2 inhibitors are being used in heart failure patients, as they may be shown to improve cardiac function and reduce fluid balance. So there's a lot of different uses potentially for these medications. One thing we should be aware is some of them carry the risk of hypoglycemia, such as the sulfonylureas, which actually actively increase the secretion of endogenous insulin is with these thoughts in mind that we should be considerate of continuing or discontinuing these medications around the time of surgery. So back to insulin, there's several types of insulin that have variable peaks and troughs. We can use these to treat patients. We commonly are used to ID regular insulin, which you can see as a very high peak, rapid onset, rapid decline, but also we use subcutaneous rapid acting and regular insulins, as well as long acting glargine insulin all of which have treatment options for patients with hyperglycemia or diabetes. And you can see the relative peak effect and trough represented here. Many different regimens exist to help this treatment with the basal bolus technique being the most common and likely the best. How we should treat patients with insulin is an important question that's at the root of this discussion. In 2001, a landmark paper for the New England Journal in 1500 surgical critical care patients demonstrated that tight blood glucose control, meaning 80 to 110, reduced mortality relative to a conventional treatment, which is glucose of less than 180. Follow-up studies of medical intensive care patients did not show a benefit in mortality, but did show secondary improved outcomes with intensive control of glucose, such as weaning from mechanical ventilation, ICU, and hospital discharge. The two groups, top and bottom, are simply meant to represent all patients at the top and those patients who stayed in the ICU longer than three days at the bottom. You can see the impact is noticeable across there. However, the prior studies were identified as having some flaws, most notably that large portions of the patients were composed of cardiac surgical population, many of whom would not be considered critically ill by today's standards. Therefore, in 2009, a follow-up study was done that's probably the most famous with about five times as many patients and a smaller surgical component with similar targets. This is nice sugar. 
The study demonstrated an increase in mortality with intensive control relative to conventional control. And it is this study that we now use to drive ICU management of hyperglycemia with the established targets of 110 to 180 being fairly common. And we've gotten away from tight blood glucose control. It's reasonable to ask if similar ranges have application to patients in the operating room. Some studies have been able to clarify reduced risk of negative outcomes with a range of blood glucose in the 140 to 180 range. Here's an example of cardiac surgical patients where blood glucose maintained in that range was associated with a lower risk of complication. Some other groups might see benefit with tight blood glucose control, such as cardiac surgical patients who are having bypass grafting, notably those without diabetes who had a lower risk of major adverse cardiac events, acute kidney injury, and composite negative outcomes when treated with an intensive glucose regimen. In a hepatobiliary pancreatic surgical patient population, there was a trend towards reduced risk of surgical site infections, fistula, and hospital length of stay in groups managed with intensive blood glucose strategies. We are still considering hypoglycemia to be the biggest risk of treating hyperglycemia in these patients. But in this study, there was no significant hypoglycemia, which may play a factor in the improved outcomes. In general surgery populations with a blood glucose greater than 180, administration of insulin appears to mitigate some of the effects of hyperglycemia and may reduce negative outcomes. In fact, patients who received insulin to correct hyperglycemia had no increased risk relative to those who were not hyperglycemic. So what about the variability of individual patients being treated for blood glucose elevation? In an observational retrospective and prospective 10-year single center study of glucose variability in the critically ill, we see evidence that patients that presented with increased pre-admission A1C levels may have had increased or reduced mortality with increased blood glucose. This concept is a little confusing, but essentially it appears that when patients come in with an A1C of greater than 8%, consistent with an average blood glucose level of around 180, that lowering that blood glucose actually is associated with a higher percentage of mortality in that patient population. We can also see that in pre-diabetic patients, such as those with an A1C of less than 6.5, hyperglycemia appears to be a significant risk factor in patient mortality. In the prospective component of this study, a change was made to the strategy of treating patients based on their admission in A1C. In the pre-group, all patients were treated with a blood glucose target of 90 to 120. And in the post-group, population patients were stratified according to A1C with targets of either 80 to 120 for A1C of less than seven or 110 to 160 for A1C of greater than seven. Perhaps most significantly, the patient population with the worst pre-admission blood glucose control had the lowest mortality when allowed to be closest to their pre-admission blood glucose. So very interesting findings that we certainly haven't indoctrinated into practice quite yet. Here's evidence that an increased standard deviation of blood glucose measurements relative to the mean is associated with increased mortality rate and critically ill patients. The most telling part of this graph is the extremely high mortality rate in patients with a mean blood glucose of less than 100, but who had significant variability with a broad range of standard deviation. You can see that the measurements of the purple lines all have higher mortality, at least in the lower groups. And these are measurements that are extremely variable from the mean, crossing almost all measures of blood glucose. So just to spend one more minute on this, the implication here is that as patients are more variable from their mean, having a higher standard deviation, that their mortality is likely negatively impacted with this glycemic variability. A pragmatic trial from this year recently published took it a step further, comparing a very liberal blood glucose target of less than 250 versus a conventional target. Patients at the liberal treatment group of 180 to 250 had a lower incidence of hyperglycemia and less glucose variability than those in the conservative treatment group, but there was no evidence of outcome difference here. As an aside, in critically ill patients, the use of insulin infusion has recently been identified as a risk factor for mortality, with odds of mortality increasing by approximately 6% for every 0.1 unit per kilo per day, or 7 to 10 units of IV insulin. It's unclear if this is an epi phenomenon. I suspect it's at least partially related to why those patients need IV insulin. However, 
They made every attempt to control to adjust for that. And after adjustment, there's a similar effect to, to patients having episodic hypoglycemia or those receiving excess IV fluids, both of which we feel are directly harmful to patients. Even though most of the talk has been on intravenous insulin infusion, subcutaneous insulin is a very important mode of treatment that is often overlooked. In a trial of long-acting glargine infusion or insulin, it was found to be non-inferior to continuous infusion in a medical ICU population. So that's once or twice daily long-acting insulin was able to treat patients similarly, similarly to an IV infusion. Other studies have shown that rapid-acting subcutaneous insulin is effective at maintaining blood glucose but potentially resulting in a higher instance of hypoglycemia in critically ill patients and fewer patients within goal range. So potentially not for all groups. So what we know is that patients with hyperglycemia are associated with worse clinical outcomes. Taking this a step further, we can presume that the impact of hyperglycemia coupled with baseline health conditions can lead to impact on outcomes indirectly. But what appears to be more likely is that these effects are like are impacting both sides, and that it's not just hyperglycemia, but glycemic variability that impacts outcomes. What other things might help manage the hyperglycemic patient? Work done at Vanderbilt, researchers showed that an intraoperative alert is associated with a redu reduction in surgical site infections in a diabetic population. This alert was triggered when the anesthesia charting reminded the provider that the patient met criteria for glucose monitoring with evidence of their prior glucose and prior treatments and gave the provider the opportunity to check or defer. The impact of this intervention was a reduction in the number of patients with a blood glucose of over 250 in PACU, as well as a reduction in surgical site infections. Another tool that could be used to monitor and treat blood glucose abnormalities is shown here. While this is a proprietary tool, I don't endorse it or any specific tool, just showing how they work. The software processes the prior data and the current state of the patient and feeds back to the provider trends and opportunities. Some evidence is shown from the paper on the right that using tools such as this results in glucose levels that are closer to goal and more consistently there. Continuous glucose monitoring has become an important part of outpatient diabetic management. These devices are worn on or under the skin and feedback data immediately or in batches to either proprietary handheld devices or smartphones. They provide good short and long-term data about blood glucose control for patients and providers. When considering whether to use a CGM for patients with inpatient blood glucose, it should be noted that the FDA has not yet approved for this indication, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it can't be done. It's important to understand that they're not perfect and have error ranges. When studied in patients in operating rooms, the error range was about 10% from the mean, consistent with the device packaging. It seems that there is reasonable fidelity in values between 100 and 200, and possibly a little more scatter at extreme values. When looking at these devices in sicker patients or those undergoing cardiac surgery with bypass or those on vasopressors, we see more device failure represented by measurements from the CGM device that were lower than the actual glucose consistently. Those are represented uh, in the group on the right where you can see separation between the actual blood glucose in red and those measured by the CGM in blue. So the group on the left were successful recovering sensors and the group on the right had failed. One important aspect of this is it doesn't seem that any of the CGM devices uh, data was artificially high, which likely serves to protect the patient from acute hypoglycemia, even though it may fail at minimizing hyperglycemic episodes. Overall, the reliability was a bit worse than that demonstrated in the OR or the package insert, but showed promise that devices like this could potentially be used for glucose monitoring in hospital care. The use of insulin pumps, another aspect of diabetes management that confounds physicians in the hospital when treating patients for acute conditions. Societal recommendations are to continue insulin pump management for patients that are having shorter surgeries, and especially in ambulatory settings, and patients that are expected to have large fluid shifts, be critically ill, or have uh, surgical site interference should stop and remove their insulin pump prior to surgery. It's important to realize that insulin pumps are primarily used in type one diabetics, and these patients are insulin dependent. So being off an insulin infusion uh, is likely to be a large problem for these patients and they will need an alternative insulin source. 
can see here an example of a closed loop glucose system where a CGM monitor is paired with an insulin pump and provides real time feedback to adjust pump levels based upon interstitial blood glucose. Some downsides exist, such as the aforementioned surgical site interference, and the fact that complex cases or those with expected longer times are not likely to be as reliable at treating blood glucose as it comes up. In addition, these devices can be impacted by common medical tools, such as x-ray, electrocautery, MRI, and CT, and it is recommended they be removed rather than subjected to those devices. Ultimately, the insulin pump is a reasonable alternative to maintaining someone's blood glucose when they present for shorter surgeries and when this device can be kept out of the way of the surgical field. This is an example of how we can utilize the patient's outpatient regimen to optimize their inpatient experience. And avoiding disruption to someone's normal regimen, uh, which is something we should consider as it can have a significant medical and psychological impact. We should strongly consider using these when they are determined to be safe and reliable. I like to think about treatment of medical conditions and hospitalized patients as part of a Venn diagram and blood glucose is no different. I think we need three things to effectively treat conditions and do it to the best of our abilities. We need knowledge of the situation, the impact and the safety profile of our treatments. We need the motivation to inform ourselves, engage with the patient and create and implement an appropriate and effective plan. And unfortunately, we also need things. These things can be similar to the ones we described here, such as automated alerts or algorithmic approaches to blood glucose management. They could be continuous glucose monitoring or insulin pumps, or even so far as to have separate insulin regimens available from inpatient pharmacy. When we have all three of these things, we have the best success of treating any condition that requires multiple facets of care. But we should also be aware that even having portions of this can result in improved outcomes. We don't have to have the fanciest things as long as we have both the motivation and the information we need to treat patients safely and effectively. Adding the things can reduce the need to have the most up-to-date knowledge base and honestly can reduce the need to have extreme motivation. You can see how a little bit of overlap here can create a scenario where having part of these can still result in appropriate management of most medical conditions. So what does patient-centric mean to me? Well, every medical engagement has a patient involved. So it's a bit silly to say patient-centric. I mean, shouldn't we all think everything is patient-centric? While we put the patient first in medical care, we also often heavily weigh the benefit to the physician and the institution, as well as the community for the way we deliver medical care. In a patient-centered approach, we can still do these things. We must focus on understanding the patient's wishes and expectations while explaining the care and the plan and providing support to the patient and their support system. We need to ensure the safety and security of the patient as well as the transitions of care, physical and emotional comfort are important as well. So it's more about than just handholding. It's about providing a safe place and utilizing the best tools at your disposal to make sure that patients are well taken care of and also that they feel well taken care of, both of which are outcomes that are important in the shared journey. So appropriating Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the psychological diagram that's meant to describe self-preservation, I like to think of a medical analogy to that that brings into play glucose management. As with any major medical condition or any medical condition, we must first do no harm. We have to avoid hypoglycemia in these patients, and we must try to avoid extreme hyperglycemia as well as failing to monitor patients at risk for either. We must ensure the patients that are at risk or that have conditions that need to be monitored or treated do so, get it in a timely fashion. It's not the perioperative physician's responsibility to dictate to other services, but it is a fundamental part of a patient-centric approach to maximize safety and transitions of care. We should consider the patient's wishes and how they want to perceive their care. Diabetic patients are often very well managed and have their strict parameters by which they consider their day a success. If we avoid their plan in favor of one that we choose without strong evidence, we may do the patient a disservice. And what may be just fine by engaging the patient in the process is that they'll become more committed to the success of the plan that the patient and physician come up with together, and this can make all the difference. Even though our primary goal is to treat the patient, we can use uh, if we can use some of these luxuries, such as things the patient has with them, their home medications, devices that uh, we think may help or know may help. Um, those are things that may help us, in, a, in fact, build on this pyramid here. Um, and our primary goal is to treat the patient. Good patient care positively impacts the medical system we work in. Reducing complications, we impact downstream effects, facilitate earlier discharge, reduce inpatient and outpatient complications, all of which help both patient and environment, leading to, of course, nirvana. <laughs>
So even though our primary goal is to treat the patient, good patient care um, positively impacts the medical system we work in. I think we have a couple of opportunities that are a little bit different. A surgery patient who is hyperglycemic has a very narrow range of opportunity to be impacted, which exists almost exclusively in the healthcare system. We can't always predict when and why these patients arrive, and we can't always know why they are hyperglycemic. Patients with diabetes, on the other hand, have a much longer course that they can be theoretically impacted both in preparation towards their medical care and in recovery from it. And while that's beyond the scope of this talk, we should understand that expanding these areas in which patient engagement allows for better glucose management can almost definitely expect to improve patient outcomes after surgery. Should be clear that, or we should make it clear that a lot of this talk has to do with patients presenting for longer surgeries or potentially more complex surgeries. Institutional societies have recommendations for blood glucose management and ambulatory patients or those with very short surgeries have a much more relaxed set of criteria. And as we think about who we're going to be aggressive in treating, it's not going to be those patients who show up for ambulatory surgery and are heading home, going to follow up on their own. But as we think about appropriate management, we should include everybody uh, on all plans. So at a bare minimum for glucose management of the 21st century, we have to employ strategies to protect diabetic patients from extreme hyperglycemia and protect all patients from hypoglycemia. If we're able to see type two diabetic patients before a surgical procedure, it's reasonably safe to hold all their diabetic medications, including insulin, check day of surgery, blood glucose in diabetic patients and treat glucose that is high, probably with IV insulin boluses. We've talked about how the durability of the IV insulin bolus is poor, but in any acute management, we will see some benefit in reducing hyperglycemia. We should understand this is a strategy that is unlikely to provide durable care for hyperglycemia, but it can help to mitigate the stress of extremes of uncontrolled hyperglycemia while also having a very low risk of hypoglycemia. But I think most major institutions are practicing more of a second decade of the 21st century approach holding some home diabetic medications and administering some insulin in patients, especially based upon the type of surgery and how well their blood glucose is controlled at home. Checking day of surgery blood glucose in all patients can help identify those that may be at higher risk for perioperative complication. Treating blood glucose at over a certain value using an IV insulin infusion and maintaining blood glucose at a safe range in all patients, and then facilitating transition off IV insulin before they leave the recovery area. This is a standard approach that mirrors our practice and likely mimics most safe practices around the country. Again, this is expected to universally treat diagnosed hyperglycemia and try to manage a range, maintain a range and protect patients from hypoglycemia. What do I think the ideal approach looks like? Well, it's, it's bulky. There's a lot going on here. Um, I think we have some holes in the way that we diagnose and treat and identify patients at risk. So some of this is unexplored or underexplored territory. We likely need better stratification based upon preoperative blood glucose and possibly A1C and possibly something we don't even know yet, especially in complex surgical patients or those who are at high risk of complications. This can help determine who needs what type of care. We should consider maintaining the dose of appropriate home medications, including insulin per protocol, especially for those patients who are not expected to have significant disruptions in their ability to take these when they leave rather than make people hold medications for two or three days or adjust their insulin and have significant periods of uh, glycemic disruption around the time of surgery, we should be able to develop strategies that allow patients to continue their regimens in the appropriate situation. We should discuss the preoperative management, such as my plan, with the patient utilizing their outpatient regimen as able and consider formulating a plan with their endocrinologist, PCP, or other physicians using home devices when appropriate. The patient has a CGM and an insulin pump or closed loop system. We should not have to arbitrarily say that it can't be used. And if it is safe and the efficacy is appropriate, we should look to consider a way to utilize those in our medical environment. We need to develop targeted blood glucose therapies. A safe range of 140 to 180 or 110 to 200 is likely okay for most patients. And it's probably okay to stay there. We likely are not going to cause harm but I suspect there are areas that we could improve upon with this range. We've seen evidence of certain patient populations that benefit from lower blood glucose, such as our cardiac surgical population, 
possibly our hepatobiliary surgical population. We've seen those that may not benefit from lower blood glucose as well. Our main goal should be to avoid hypoglycemia at all costs, but we should start to respect extreme hyperglycemia and figure out how we can correct that safely. Within this framework, we have to consider reduction, reducing glucose variability. So a relatively novel concept, but as we have seen in the evidence presented, the impact is likely very significant, especially in those patients who are not diabetic and have stress, hyperglycemia, or other types of hyperglycemia. We have innovators in every location, and we have more, tech, more technological resources than we've ever had, and the utilization of electronic health records and of our medical applications provides us the opportunity to use machine learning, augmented intelligence, and automated alerts to help drive medical care at all levels. And we should consider this application for blood glucose management and our goal to universally treat diagnosed hyperglycemia and protect patients from hypoglycemia. So broken down into what I think the key components of a patient-centric approach to blood glucose is having a way to identify patients at harm or at higher risk for complication, avoiding things we know to be harmful, such as extreme variability and missing uh, administering insulin to patients who need it. Avoid uh, failure to monitor blood glucose, being the, another thing that would be harmful, being aware of the patient's goals and trying to mirror them when appropriate and are intertwining that with patients and specialist plan uh, and outpatient plans and mirroring those when appropriate. All of this will help optimize the workload and efficiency on the provider and system and a goal that we may find through better preemptive approaches and better knowledge, we can optimize that indirectly and create an environment whereby the things that happen organically through practice improvement, and that should be our goal. So all of these approaches together should help create a patient-centric approach to blood glucose. In summary, before I free things up to take a few questions, if there are any, we should be clear, type one and type two patients need different strategies. And while the goals are similar, they may need to be modified. 110 to 200 is probably safe in all patients, but likely not ideal. And again, I can't stress enough that type one diabetic patients must be managed differently than type two. They need insulin. They need insulin regimens uh, prescribed and delivered and frequent uh, blood glucose checks. Hyperglycemia, hypoglycemia, and extreme variability are all associated with complications. We should try to avoid all of them. Non-diabetic hyperglycemic patients may be at higher risk of complication. And this is territory that we're still learning about. We don't know the full impact. And we don't know necessarily um, how to stratify these patients yet, but I'm hoping that that's work that we can find information out from shortly. Insulin remains the standard of care for inpatient and perioperative patients. Some home regimens can be continued through surgery, however. Others have a more significant risk of hyperglycemia. References are available to, to guide you when considering whether to stop or continue home regimens. Vigilance with treatment and follow-up is important to ensure quality care. And a patient-centric approach has many facets. I value the safety and the patient autonomy aspects and encourage creating a plan with the patient, which can even be done in the holding room. I can explain to a patient um, I can explain to a patient what my plan is, and we can have an engagement on how they feel about that plan. They may prefer fewer blood glucose sticks. They may prefer a more dedicated regimen that they're comfortable with. And I think we should be able to work within that framework. So with that said, I appreciate everyone listening to this uh, conversation and talk. I did go through a little bit quickly. So I have a few minutes for questions if there are any. Patrick, can you hear me? I can. Okay, good. Sorry. I couldn't tell if it's my Wi-Fi or yours because I had no. a break there. So anyhow, first off, thank you. That was phenomenal. Um, I appreciate you sharing and and um, sorry to hear about your sister, but that definitely uh, personalizes this. Um, and I, um, wow, the uh, tour de force. I, I, I'm seeing... Um, some questions come through. I know, I know Anne has one and then um, I put a couple in there. Uh, maybe we'll start with Anne's. Um, so Dr. Gifford from High Rise Clinic, who, if everyone doesn't know her on the inpatient side, um, Anne is a geriatrician. 
who spends typically every Wednesday or three Wednesdays a month in clinic as the high-rise attending and teaches us a ton uh, from the um, uh, medical management, uh, particularly outpatient medical management of patients. And it's just been a joy to have her on our team. Um, She says, uh, we recommend often recommend oral vitamin C for wound healing prior to surgery. Can you speak to recommendations for monitoring blood sugar or adjustment of insulin for those on vitamin C? And I, I think that um, we've, and I'll kind of combine with one from Linda Perkins, who is um, our nurse practitioner from clinic, who's terrific. uh, And that they had found some literature on um, oral vitamin D uh, higher doses, which I'm not sure exactly how high those doses are, but that they could affect uh, CGM devices and and the readings there. So in any, either as an intensivist or in the perioperative period, uh, have you, do you have any thoughts about interactions of vitamin C and blood glucose monitoring? Sure. And, and we've used um, high dose vitamin C. And I think um, what I've learned from the ICU is that uh, high anything can really impact both point of care testing and optical testing. And so when things don't make sense or when they don't result, I often think about something that's way higher than it should be. With that said, I know there's association between vitamin C and I believe uncoupling of the insulin response to glycemia. The problem in the ICU setting is we're always doing these things with frequent checks and uh, monitoring patients very closely. The challenge then becomes Um, If you're giving high dose vitamin C and not checking anything, there would likely be an impact there. So that's a bit of a challenge. And I think in the patient who's insulin dependent or on insulin, I think it would should make us a little more careful as far as the prescription of those things and maybe a reference to things that the the typical provider might not be aware of, right? Like high dose vitamin C is associated with problems managing blood glucose. We might need to take a a little more uh, like focused approach here at looking at this. So an indirect answer to the question, except to say that I think it is impact, it can be impactful. Okay. Hey, Patrick, uh, yeah. can I ask a couple of quick questions? Thanks for that yeah. uh, incredible talk. Um, I had one question just based on your, um, you know, looking through all the literature, um, do you have any recommendations for the specific proportion of insulin that patients should take the night before surgery and like specifically long acting insulin? And secondly, um, does that require a nuanced approach for patients who are, you know, say type two and on a lower insulin regimen versus, I I know there's like an increasing incidence of type um, Mm 1.5, patients are essentially insulin dependent. Um, So do you have any thoughts on on, um, any, any recommendations there? Yeah. Yeah, and I think this speaks to one of Matt's questions as, or McAvoy's questions as well. Uh, Glargine, we haven't crossed the threshold of doing this, but it's absolutely a reasonable consideration. And probably one of the best physiologic things we could do is to provide a stressful, a stressed patient with a basal rate of a glu- of a insulin. So the societal recommendations are to continue Glargine in most patients at a mildly reduced dose. For patients that take it in the morning, they should reduce the dose a little bit more than patients that take it at night, I believe. Um, And patients, and this is another reason why it's important to uh, schedule your your diabetic patients, especially ones that are challenging earlier in the day, so they don't have to be NPO for a prolonged period of time. But glargine has been determined to be safe at doses of 50 to 75% of their baseline dose. And even starting glargine on acutely hyperglycemic patients, it's deemed to be safe if you give 0.3 units per kilo to almost anybody. So that's a dose of 20 to 30 units of glargine for almost anybody uh, in the acute hyperglycemic patient who uh, should be enough to uh, help them. At least that's what our endocrinologists have advised. So for that, um, and then I apologize, I lost track on the second part of your of your question, Matt. Um, I didn't oh, write I was it. Just, oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that uh, explanation. I was just uh, wondering if, if you had a more nuanced approach to a patient who ha- is like a type 2 diabetic with a smaller dose versus like a type 1.5 that requires a higher dose. Do you have, do you, do you have a, a thought process that would um, 
Yeah, and I actually, I wonder, I kind of look at that, uh, I've seen different scenarios there, right? And another thing that I didn't mention was type 1 patients, right, require a very small amount of insulin. Often these patients are on, uh, you know, getting 20 to 25 units a day as a basal and a few units as a bolus. So sometimes we'll give, you know, we I, I've had patients at 50 units an hour in the post-cardiac surgical population. So there's definitely some differences there. And as far as the overlap, the type 1.5, I'm just getting exposed to that clinically and seeing that there's some different types. There are patients that are requiring less insulin and more insulin. And I think we can't stress enough that hypoglycemia has to be avoided. And as we're practicing at the bedside, we have no way of knowing how a patient is going to respond except for what their historical use of insulin is. So if a patient comes in taking 100 of Lantus at night and 20 with meals, of rapid, I feel pretty comfortable that I can give them the amount of insulin I think they need, as opposed to a type one diabetic who, if you've ever accidentally almost written a type one diabetic 10 units and found out that they take 0.6 units an hour, you realize how complex that care is. So the nuance for me is absolute prevention of hypoglycemia, which we know to be directly related to outcomes. I think as we get better in planning for these patients, and uh, getting more algorithmic approaches will be better suited to treat them both with what we choose to use, such as subcutaneous regimens over or in addition to IV regimens, but also the amount. So I think that's part of the goal here is to not practice the one size fits all of stopping every medicine, treating with a brute force dose of insulin in the operating room. If people are gonna be hyperglycemic, let them be hyperglycemic and send them home um, I think we we probably aren't helping as much as we think we are with those. Thank you. Um, also see from Charlie, any work out there on the difference in glycemic control when FFP is used for trauma resuscitation? I think any put here like with glycocalyx <laughs> preservation rather than crystalloid. Yeah, that's a good question, Charlie. I know that uh, I know that um, you know colloid resuscitation can actually help. Um, maintain the glycocalyx. And my thought there is it's the reduction in total volume. So crisp, large crystalloid resuscitations disrupt everything. And I think a lot of it is, you know, the third space disrupts everything anyway. And then the amount of fluid we give is so disruptive. So from an FFP standpoint, I think we could get a little bit of the same impact that we would with albumin. We might actually preserve a little bit of the glycocalyx and it would be hard to balance out the impact of the trauma versus the resuscitation there. Um, but I know that our trauma surgeons, right, we don't use any crystalloid here if we can avoid it. And so we may have actually a pretty interesting uh, population to study that in. Awesome. Um, anyone feel free to speak up or keep typing. Um, one, one more that I had. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can now? Hi. Yeah. Hi, Patrick. Um, I was just wondering, thank you for the talk. It was great. Um, if you have any insight into, you had mentioned um, that there were some studies that suggested that maintaining whatever the patient's normoglycemia was is better than using the um, 110 to 180 um, measurement. And I was wondering if there are any institutions or if you've seen any move towards clinical practice of maintaining a patient's own blood glucose because I haven't seen that yet clinically, and I didn't know if there were any places where they were doing that, especially in critically ill patients. Yeah, so the ambulatory guidelines advocate that, right? So if you come in for an ambulatory surgery and your glucose is 230, the ambulatory <laughs> guidelines are kind of like, well, okay, let them be 230, maybe check it again, right? But we don't push our those patients to get them to under 180. Um, and so there's definitely some safety overlap there. I think the inter interesting thing about those studies is they kind of cap at the 180 range, right? Like those A1Cs of eight. They don't really extend too much into the what happens when a patient's 300, should you leave them at 300? Um, so nobody's gonna advocate for that. Um, but I think the problem then becomes when patients are 300 and then they're 70 and then they're 220 and 150, those are the areas where we can improve. Um, Brittany, and I think to your point, like being a little bit more not that we're not thoughtful, but being more thoughtful to what our ultimate goal is and trying to reduce the variability of getting there. That's why insulin infusions help us so much in the ICU because we're constantly checking blood glucose. If you were checking with sub-Q regimens, you might not go, you might not check again for two to four hours 
and who knows what the patient's glucose is doing in that time. So I do think the variability is really a key point that we're not fully understanding yet, but I also think that the studies that have addressed it tend to kind of cap that 250 range, right, was sort of where we saw, and it's real nebulous above that. Um, but yeah, you're right, that's different than we've practiced, and, and I have actually advocate for tighter blood glucose control in some patients, but we should be aware that how they live, we often joke, right, when patients come in and they say, oh, no, I live at 250, and you're like, well, you're going to be 150 today, um, and they feel bad, and, and I mean, I'm guilty of this, I'm kind of like, yeah, yeah, you feel bad, it's normal, but they do, they experience some sort of impact from that, and uh, we trying, we're trying to get better at, at uh, reducing that. All right. Um, Thank you. Anybody else? We have a minute left. I, I'm, I guess maybe I'll just, because I can, I'll, I'll get my question in there. Um, if I heard you correctly, you talked about maybe in the future, stopping fewer oral meds, particularly if there's not going to be a big N NPO disruption. So did, did I hear that right? Mm -hmm. So l imagine someone's going to be allowed to eat immediately post-op, like a total knee or total hip. Do you envision that being the future? And then for those who are made NPO, maybe even for a day, sometimes clearly there's longer, but as the post-op patient resumes diet, it seems like what they do now is everything is stopped at sliding scale insulin until they go home. Did I hear you correctly to say, actually, what is better is, I think what we've thought for a while, but what you're saying yeah. is, is start start layering back, either layer back on, do you resume everything? How, how would How do you do that? Yeah, there's some there's some things that we should consider absolutes. So sulfonylureas, such as the glipizides, we should not give those the day of surgery. Um, they promote hypoglycemia, and that risk is concerning. Metformin should not be given to patients with renal dysfunction. However, the risk of lactic acidosis is really overblown, and that risk really exists with the prior iteration of the drug fenformin much more than metformin. However, you still hear about cases with metformin. Um, and the other drugs are a little bit nebulous as well. We talked about SGLT2 inhibitors, which have tremendous impact outside of blood glucose, but they have a really significant impact on volume status. And so something we wouldn't normally consider uh, when we're thinking about blood glucose is we could make someone hypovolemic by continuing their SGLT2 inhibitor. And so there's a lot of nuance here as this as well, but there are some medications and some situations, and these are in uh, nat, like people that speak, talk about this, like Elizabeth Duggan uh, has really great uh, framework on what drugs to give and when. And so appropriating some of that for your practice, if you get the opportunity to see patients, especially complex patients and say, hold this the day of, take this the night before, um, especially if you're anticipating them being back on their PO regimen. If you know they're going to be in the hospital for a week and NPO, then it makes it probably easier to say, don't take your, you know, your, your uh, GLP agonist, don't take your Bietta, hold this. Um, but if you're going to be going home the next day and you don't want to disrupt the regimen, I think that's how we could get better. So a really good point, Matt. And there are recommendations for all of those that are actually shifting more towards giving things and away from holding them. <laughs> yes. And Matt, we'll, we'll get some, uh, we'll, we'll get some weight loss management uh, <laughs> shots for each season. Well, um, that was, boy, that was awesome. Still uh, a ton to work out and, and clearly being developed, but um, wow. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and uh, everyone, we are recording these uh, with the goal of getting approval from Vanderbilt to be posting them on YouTube. So I think there's a lot here to uh, to go back and be able to look at again if you want to. So um, Patrick, thanks so much. Really, really appreciate you putting this together. And um, everybody, I hope you have a wonderful Wednesday evening.